Hey everybody, this is Pierre Quinn and you're listening to the Leading Wild Green Podcast where my mission is to help you live, learn, and lead with confidence. On episode number 10, we're talking about NBA injuries, why you need to avoid pointless debates, some insights from parent-teacher conferences, some notes from my trip to the toy store, and of course, the revision conference. So, listen up. So the NBA season is in full swing. And honestly, it's it's been tough to watch from the aspect of the injuries, the injuries that have happened so far in the NBA season. Is, and it's only a couple of days old. It's 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 been tough to watch. Probably the most difficult is the clip of Gordon Hayward from the Boston Celtics injuring his tibia and dislocating his ankle. So he broke his tibia and he dislocated his ankle. And I was sitting on the couch watching this game. It was the Boston Celtics versus the Cleveland Cavaliers. And watching this live, Gordon Hayward going up, I be, if I remember correctly, correctly, he was going up for an alley-oop. And he didn't, he didn't catch the ball, came down. On one leg, just landed funny, and you just watched on the screen how he just his leg kind of buckled, his his ankle was turned around. It wasn't pretty to watch. And TNT, the the station that was showing the game live, was was pretty classy. I think they only showed uh, maybe one replay, one or two replays, and they showed it from a different angle, so you didn't see the gruesomeness of it. But this was six minutes into the first quarter of the first game of the NBA season. And Gordon Hayward, who just signed a multimillion dollar contract, injured himself six minutes into the season and he's doing surgery. They said he should hopefully should be back uh, by by midseason. But you know how timetables, how timetables are. And the and the question I was asking myself when I was watching what was taking place, and it was it was really it was really tough to watch, even watching live, and then the replay, and all of the players just stopped on the court, and and people were kneeling down to pray, and uh, team members were coming together, and it was just a hush hush tones and whispers over the arena. One of the questions in my head was. How 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 much is it going to take for him to bounce back from this particular injury? What's it going to take? It, and he's is he going to be able to play at the level that he was playing at before? Now, on the opposing team, the Cleveland Cavaliers uh, in the offseason, they had acquired a player by the name of Derrick Rose. Uh, Derrick Rose was an NBA all star, one of the one of the bright spots in the league. Um, just, just, just a big deal in Chicago when he played for the Chicago Bulls. But Derrick Rose suffered really two tough knee injuries that that many people feel felt set his career back and felt like he would never be able to make it back from those injuries and be be himself. He played for the New York Knicks last year and he had a pretty good season. But the thing about professional sports is there's there's this timeline of perceived effectiveness and. And it's almost as if if you don't strike where the iron is hot and why while you have the spotlight, you almost miss your opportunity. So Derek Rose had a great season last year and people were trying to trying to figure out what was going to become of him because because, of course, everybody wants him to reach his former glory. But he had a really good season after battling over his career, these two difficult injuries that, that people say when you have two injuries like that, you don't, you don't do a good job of coming back from, but he, but he came back from them and he, he's standing on the, he's on the court. He's playing in the same game as Gordon Hayward. So on one end, you have someone who's suffered a difficult in- injury and you're trying to figure out when they're coming back from the injury. 
And on the other hand, you have someone who has who has gone through the injuries, gone through surgeries and is rebuilding his career and you see him playing effectively. So so you see the evidence of being able to come back from an injury or difficulty and play a play at a high level. Another name that comes to mind is Sean Livingston of the Golden State Warriors. He's a two time NBA champion. I believe Sean used to play for the Clippers. Uh, back in the early 2000s, and one of the most gruesome videos on the internet, Sean Livingston going up for a layup in a in a basketball game, and he just his his leg just buckles, it just crumbles, and he he dislocated his patella and his tibia, and it was it was just really tough, really tough to watch if you were watching that game live or even even the replays or the or the recordings on YouTube. When people ask the question, could Sean Livingston ever come back from an injury like that? I think he bounced, he came back, bounced around to a couple teams, and he found himself on the Golden State Warriors. And now he's a two-time NBA champion. What you see from Sean Livingston, though, is that he can't, he can't perform. And I don't know if it's, if it's a physical thing or it's a mental thing. That, that he's unable to perform the same way that he, he performed before, but he, he's adjusted his game. He's adjusted his game to be one of the most effective players at his, at his position and opportunity. He comes off the bench as the point guard for the, for the Golden State Warriors. And you saw when they, they won the NBA championship in 2015 and in 2017, when he was on the floor, he was just literally abusing the the opposing point guard at his position. He has this mid-range short jump shot game. He knows how to find people and he's working he's working with the adjustments in his body after this catastrophic injury. And that's the thing about brokenness. Brokenness requires a different approach. I'll say it again. Brokenness requires a different approach. If you if you've had some some type of brokenness, if it maybe it's a physical injury, maybe it's an emotional breakdown, maybe it's sort of a relational thing, but brokenness requires a different approach. Broken brokenness demands that you don't approach life the same way. And often we look at these accidents that happen to us as our end. We look at these difficulties as our end. Some of us are are on here and we're we're starting just different projects and they haven't turned out the way that we wanted them to or, or we've lost money or we've dis- or we've been disappointed. And because of those experiences, the temptation has been to just walk away and totally give up on the idea of what we're pushing toward. But what would life be like if you learned the lessons that brokenness that brokenness can teach you? So for Gordon Hayward right now, sitting in a hospital room, wanting to play the game and suffering through the injury and the surgery and beginning to wrap his mind around recovery. He has the example of Derrick Rose. He has the example of Sean Livingston, this example of how do you adjust after brokenness and how do you experience success and achievement after brokenness? And and it's and it's possible. It's possible if you put the work in and if you change your approach. Now, speaking of the NBA, one of one of the things that just really irritates me the most about not just the NBA, about sports in general, is when we start to make these comparisons of people from different eras. We love to do that. We like to compare people from different contexts, from different situations. And there was a picture going around on social media on Facebook. It had four individuals. And it says it's, it was a picture of Michael Jordan, a picture of Kobe Bryant, a picture of, of Stephen Curry, and a picture of LeBron James. And we we love debates. Like Our culture really loved debates. And, I, and this, for me, falls under the category of, of, of a pointless debate. So the question was, you have to cut one. You you have to cut one. Who are you going to cut? Are you going to cut LeBron? Are you going to cut Stephen Curry? Are you going to cut Kobe Bryant? Are you going to cut Michael Jordan? And one of the things that we rarely admit when we have these, I consider them pointless debates, pointless conversations, is the impact of marketing 
the impact of perception, the impact of monetary value. Let's be completely honest. The sports industry is built on monetary value. It's not primarily there to entertain you. It's it's there to generate income. So that's first. Second is marketing is everything. Marketing is everything. Michael Jordan, many people argue Michael Jordan is one of the greatest players that ever played in the NBA. But the buzz surrounding Michael Jordan when he came out of out of North Carolina was nowhere near the buzz surrounding LeBron James when he came out of high school. No, nowhere near at all. The the fact that LeBron signed a multi-million dollar contract with Nike before he played his first NBA game and and all of these cameras were following him. And, you know, this is before the 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 use of social media that we have today still pretty was still pretty powerful, but not the same. And his perceived monetary value was so great. Got a bit of a, a cold ugh, or something. Uh, but his perceived monetary value was was so great, and he's driving revenue. And those who who make money off LeBron are driving his face, driving his 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 brand in your face. And I'm not saying he's not a great basketball player, but I recognize the amount of marketing behind. And this is how it works: the more marketing, the more marketable you are, the more revenue you can generate. Then you can get better trainers, you can get better coaches, you can hire better nutritionists, you have better doctors. It's it's there. There are some people probably in the hood, people who didn't go to a division one school who can who can run circles around some of these NBA players. And you see it when you see when you when you watch things like the Rucker uh, basketball league or you watch these street ball leagues, these. These players can play really well and they could have made it at the NBA level. But if it wasn't for one or two things, sometimes it was just a dumb mistake. But the more marketable you are, the more access you you have and you get greater resources and the greater resources actually allow you to elevate your game. Uh, Maybe that's a totally different conversation altogether, but (laughs) we just we just had it. We just had it anyway. But but back to really the main the main thrust of what I was focusing toward. We're trying to compare people of different eras. The NBA and Michael Jordan's era is was totally different than the NBA and Kobe Bryant's era. The high highlight of, of Kobe Bryant playing is different than the than the highest the height the height of Kobe's career, the NBA was different than when it was in the height of Michael Jordan's career. The same thing with LeBron, the height of his career. And some people still think that he's at the height of his career. But the NBA has shifted since he, he came into the league over a decade ago. Now we are a, a really guard driven league. We want our guards to be slashers and scorers. When when Michael Jordan was was at his height, it it was not a guard dominated league. And so the airs, the, the style of play with the shorts <laughs> were different. The shoes were different. The style of play was different. And when you have have the difference in so many era, eras, it's really hard to compare. We're saying all things being equal, but you you can't make you you can't wrap your mind around all things being equal because even the way these players train and develop for the for the era that they're in uh, has been totally different and i find that sometimes these conversations are just pointless who was the best who was the best who's the best who was the best instead of saying who who's the most effective right now but it's a but it's driven that question the best is driven by marketing again it's driven by marketing who 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 was the best is a money driven uh, conversation. And, and personally, I don't like to get into a lot of these pointless debates about who was the best player, who was the best team, because it's riddle. It's it's seasoned in opinion. It's seasoned in opinion. And it's and it's fine to talk about it. It's fine to go back and forth, but some of us take it to heart just a little bit too much in these pointless conversations. And and we have them for everything. Who's who's the best team? Which restaurant serves the best pizza? What's the best movie? What's the best song? Those are a lot of subjective conversations, a lot of opinion driven stuff. And be careful of entering into pointless debates. Some of us, some people have made a career out of it. 
You can watch these sports talk shows. They make a make they make a career of causing out of causing controversy by bringing you into these pointless pointless debates. Good entertainment many times. Good entertainment, but over the long haul, what benefit does it bring to you to have some of these pointless debates? And some of us get into fights. We get into fights on 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 the best. You know what's what what's the best place to get a root beer? I mean, you you you've heard it. It might sound silly. That that example may sound silly right now, but you could take a few minutes and and think about all the times that you have been a part of these pointless debates. Or heard about pointless debates that were driven to fist fights, people getting really upset in barber shops, at 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 games, uh, after class, just hanging out, friends fighting. I think there was a a, a store a story of not too, I maybe mean, a couple of years ago. It was a shooting, and the shooting was over. Who made the best Kool Aid? Like, what sense does that make? That's a pointless debate gone terribly wrong. So be careful of these these pointless pointless debates. Okay, enough of my rant. <laughs> enough of my rant on that. So this week, well, yesterday I had a chance to go to parent teacher conferences for my daughters, and my the teachers had glowing reports for for my daughters. Just glowing reports about how they're doing so well in school, and they're very helpful, and they're great students, and they're a pleasure to be around. And I was looking at the teachers like, mm-hmm. Because as a parent, as a parent of elementary school uh, children, uh, sometimes, and maybe you've been this way, sometimes how your children act at home is different than how they act at school. Not not in a bad way, but my wife and I were talking about this, and we were wrestling with this, this, this idea that at home, my children have have comfort, they have this freedom of expression, they they... They can really be themselves Uh, at school. It's not always like that, just the environment. And and they do well in that. They do well in both environments. But how how do we allow our children to have that freedom of expression um, at home? Sometimes as parents, we like to stifle our children by play, placing unrealistic expectations on them. We are, are always telling our children to sit down or always telling them don't make noise. And it's, that's really crazy because children are supposed to be active and supposed to make noise. And, and we've seen over the years, how, when we do that too much, by the time the person becomes a teenager or a young adult, they're, they're gun shy. They don't want, they don't want to, to make decisions or take chances because we've been really, really, squelching their initiative at a young age and we don't allow them to be comfortable. How do we create spaces for our children to be expressive and even to make noise sometimes and, and how that's a benefit for them. But, but I was listening to the teachers and the teachers in 15 minutes couldn't give me the full report. Couldn't give me a full comprehensive report. They did as best as they could, but they can't chronicle everything that has happened in the classroom and everything academically that my child has gone through. That's, that's a bit unrealistic, but it just remind reminded me that there are times in life when the things that you're working for, you won't see the outcome. You won't see the outcome of some of the things that you work for, and that's okay, but you should work toward the outcome anyway. So helping my daughters with their homework, helping them with presentations and projects, helping them make sure that they do what they're supposed to do. You don't always see the outcome of that. You see the grading reports, you see the report cards, but you don't always see the interactions in the classroom and how other people are taking notice of what your children are doing and affirming them and valuing them. But you do it for the outcome anyway, even though you won't always see, you won't always see the benefit of of the outcome. There are people who have read who've who've read my books or my blog and been motivated and inspired, but I've never met and I don't know the outcome of that work in their life. People have been in the audience for presentations that I've never met, but but hopefully, prayerfully, something that I've said in those moments has been a blessing, has been a benefit to their lives. But I'll I'll never see the outcome of that. But I but I work toward the positive outcome in the lives of others, uh, regardless of if I'll be able to see it or not. So 
just a reminder, you, you won't, you won't, you won't always get a thank you. You won't always get a good job. You won't always get a well done. You won't always get a, I appreciate, I appreciate you. But, but it's, it's, it's noble and it's the right thing to do to, to work toward a positive outcome anyway. And some people may say, well, if, if I'm not going to get a thank you or congratulations, why should I do it? And you should do it. You should work hard. You should push forward because it's the right thing to do. And because you want to make a good use of the gifts and talents and abilities that you have been given. I was in, I was in the music store with my daughter who was getting her violin repaired. And I saw all of these guitars hanging on the wall. And I thought about the fact that that many times in life, we're like these guitars hanging on the wall. We have an opportunity. We have a capacity to to do something beautiful, to make beautiful music. But we we won't play. A guitar only works if someone picks it up and plays it. And it works really well if someone picks it up and plays it who knows what they're doing. It works extremely well. And our gifts, our talents, our abilities are like that. We 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 like to let them lie dormant because of fear or or because of people projecting their their limitations on us. And I was talking about that on Facebook Live uh, yesterday. The opinions of other people uh, put us in a place where we're willing to lie dormant with our talents and abilities sometimes. But you got to you got to pick up what you've been given and you got to play and you got to play till you get better. And you got to play to the music that comes out of you is 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 beautiful and and, and and impacts lives. But but as long as you let your stuff sit there, I know I say this over and over and over again, but a big component of leadership, a big component of leadership is working in the area of your abilities and in the area of your inabilities, of your weakness, of your of your shortcoming, connecting to and aligning with people who are strong in the areas that you are weak and letting them shine. But you won't be able to let anybody else shine and work effectively if you're not allowing yourself to do the same thing. So don't don't be a guitar on the shelf. Don't let your gifts and talents and skills be a guitar on the shelf. Pick that stuff up and play and make some make some beautiful music. When we were leaving the toy store, when we were leaving the music store a couple of doors down was a toy store and we went into the toy store my wife and my two daughters and we just well for my wife and I we had a trip down memory lane we saw many of the old toys that we used to play with growing up G.I. Joe's uh, Cabbage Patch you know for my wife Barbie dolls uh, Legos and it was really a walk down memory lane and it, and it hit me standing in that toy store it was old comic books outside that that you could that you could flip through it really hit me in the toy store having that nostalgic feeling that what you collect defines you what you collect defines you this is a vintage toy store because the 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 owners collect vintage toys and and they have a, a a passion, a desire, a a a impulse to connect vintage toys, and uh, and collecting these vintage toys tells a unique story. But what you what you collect defines you. And some people do the classic car thing; they collect classic cars, or you collect souvenir pins, or you collect spoons, or you. A good friend of mine collects collects sneakers. What what you collect defines you. And it, and it's also the case in a negative sense. What what you collect, what you what you store up, what you put on display defines you. And a lot of us have done a very good job over the years at just collecting the bad stories and the bad experiences and putting those on display and highlighting those and putting those under glass and shining a light on them. And it's hard for us to to pivot or make a transition in life because we we allow ourselves to only be defined by the negative things that have happened to us and the negative things have have significant impact they they've shaped us they've they've hurt us they've they've sometimes have guided us down the wrong path but but there's a way to get past being a curator of only just negative stories 
there, there's a way to highlight the positive stories because the negative stories don't have to define you. But if it's the only thing that you collect in your life, it's the if it's the only thing that you highlight in your life, then that's what's going to define you. And that's what's going to drive you. And and sto- sharing stories is one of the things that we're going to talk about at the revision conference, October, October 29th, University of Maryland, Baltimore campus, the revision conference. It's it's a half day personal, professional and spiritual leadership experience designed to help you dream, imagine and plan again around the area of your life's greatest calling. We'll have motivational sessions. We'll have group coaching. We'll have networking. We'll have strategy. We'll actually help you put a plan together for life change. We'll we'll take you through the process, the journey of revision and the cycle of change and how it works. And we really, really want you in the building. You can go to revision. 2017.eventbrite.com and and get your tickets for the revision conference. Listen, what we're offering in this half day session, you should, you should really be paying hundreds of dollars for this. I've gone to events where, where people weren't giving you organizations, weren't giving you this much content, but you were paying hundreds of dollars because of the names associated with it. I'm telling you, these sessions will be power packed. The conversations will be life changing. It will be an incredible experience. And you want to be in Baltimore. If you're anywhere in the DMV area, you want to make your way to Baltimore, October 29th for the revision conference on the campus of University of Maryland, Baltimore. That's revision2017.eventbrite.com. And I need you to register today, revision2017.eventbrite.com. And if you can't make it, and you want to sponsor somebody or you want to sponsor 10 people or you want to be one of the major contributor contributing sponsors to the conference. Um, you can, you can register for those 10 people you want to sponsor, or you can send me an email Pierre at Pierre And we can connect on that. But this revision conference is going to be an incredible experience. We had one back in July at Bowie State University, and it was power packed. It was a power packed, super packed, energetic day, introspective day, heartwarming day. We laughed. We shed tears. We had breakthroughs. We, 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 we connected with others. We started initiatives. So we need you. We need you in the building for the revision conference. As we help you dream, imagine and plan again around the areas of major life change, because, you know, you need to make changes. You know, you need to make changes in your personal life in your professional life financially as an entrepreneur, as a ministry leader. You know, you need to make some changes somewhere. And the revision conference will help you put a plan together to make those changes that, you know, you need to make. So we want to see you in the building. Well, unfortunately, that's all I got for this episode of Leading While Green. This has been episode number 10, and I hope you take what we've shared today to heart and use it to live, to learn, to lead with confidence. And I'm here for you. I want to hear your leadership story. I want to hear your leadership journey. I want to hear what's happening in your life. Also, I want to ask you to drop a review of the podcast on iTunes. Reviews make a huge difference and reviews allow me to share what I'm doing with with a greater audience. The more reviews you have, the more your content is discoverable. So leave me a review on iTunes. I also upload the podcast on YouTube and on my blog, PRCQuinn.com and drop me a line. You got a podcast episode suggestion? Hit me up. PRCQuinn, PR at PRCQuinn.com. And until next time, take care. And God bless.